Good afternoon to everybody. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us uh, in this special webinar this afternoon, which has been made possible by the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. There are already 442 of you um, who have tuned in, so welcome. Uh, I'm just going to give a little introduction um, before we start off the, the discussion, because of course it was us at the Daily Maverick who managed to obtain um, this report and not through Professor Chipkin. But um, so the discussion with Professor Albert Chipkin, who is the director of the Governance and Public Policy Think Tank Gap. Um, and I do have to begin by saying it was not him who supplied it. Somebody else slipped it under our electronic door, as they did with Baleka and with the Public Protector. So there we found it in our foyer. The report is called um, Making Sense of State Capture in South Africa. And it, it was a submission that was made confidentially to, to the Zonda Commission. Um, we chose to publish it, uh, or a story on the report, of course, because it contains, I suppose, a deeper exploded insight uh, into the levels of state capture which have not yet really been fully explored. Um, and as, 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 as Adam notes, that the struggle is not simply between uh, avowed constitutionalists and Democrats and their opponents, uh, that the struggle today is for the very integrity of, of the state itself. Um, so it speaks to how the governing party has repurposed, I suppose, the state and access to the state to leverage uh, money and power and in itself to keep itself in government. And we'll touch on later on why it does this. What is its rationale for having done this? But um, as is quite uh, clearly evidenced by the testimony yesterday by ANC, NEC member and, and, and former speaker by Lekam Bete, uh, to the Zonda Commission, um, that she had disregarded reports uh, on the uh, on the arms deal, on possible corruption on the arms deal, as well as the Gupta leaks. Um, as she'd considered these to just be rumors. Um, and the party itself then also closed ranks uh, around these allegations. And this is a, a kind of example of what the report sets out, that despite the constitution, that the rules of the political game in South Africa are defined by the ANC. Lucky Montana's testimony too, a few, a few weeks ago, was also that it was common for the ANC to approach uh, state agency CEOs to ask for a donation uh, for the party itself. It's also important to bear in mind um, that what has become known as this, the peak state capture years during this fifth parliament and President Jacob Zuma's uh, uh, tenure occurred in a space where we have heard subsequently that the state security agency had unlimited access to cash, unlimited, uh, for smear campaigns. Um, it injected 20 million rand into Iqbal Serves uh, um, ANA. It, uh, the newspaper trained people, the state trained people, people like Ivan Pillay, uh, anyone who stood, or, or uh, Johan van Lochrenberg, the SARS uh, road unit story, uh, anyone who had, or Shadrach Sibir and Dramat in the Hawks, who stood in the way of this project um, would be got rid of um, with ample resources to the state. Uh, it also had uh, at their disposal, the state had at its disposal, ANN7, the New Age, um, and, and, and various propaganda projects, I would suppose, uh, to, to, that were funded by the state and, and other bodies of the state, including crime intelligence. There is uh, evidence that crime intelligence infiltrated journalists into newsrooms. So how, the, how South African citizens and politicians themselves hear and receive information is also governed by how, where it comes from. Um, uh, Perhaps that's why Mbete also choose, chose to ignore those, those rumors and, and sort of over many years. So we have to thank sort of journalists at Amabongani and at News24, investigative journalists at Scorpio Daily Maverick for bringing uh, this corruption with this evidence into the public realm. Uh, in actual fact, the law enforcement agencies should have done that. That should have been their jobs through Parliament, through the ANC itself, trying to stop corruption, but it didn't. So we have to... Um, uh, bear all of this in mind when we look at these contexts. So, um, uh, Ava, just please tell us sort of what prompted you um, to volunteer to submit this particular report to the Zonda Commission. And sorry for the long introduction, but it is required. No, and I'm very pleased that you made it absolutely clear that, that uh, I wasn't the source of, of the document because I was I was as surprised as everyone else to to, to see it in the Daily Maverick, especially given that Branko and I had been in conversation the day, the day before. So it really was, was a surprise to me. Um, 
I submitted it because I thought the commission itself was struggling to distinguish between corruption and state capture as distinct phenomena, and that the two concepts were being overlaid as a single concepts, uh, where the sense is that state capture really is gross corruption or, or very especially bad corruption or especially big corruption. And I think I was thinking that we needed to we needed to better um, distinguish the two concepts. And I was trying to make an intervention to the Zonda Commission to help them think through what they were finding and to distinguish therefore between corruption and state capture. And that's really what the report is trying to do. The second, the second point I wanted to make in distinguishing corruption and state capture, I wanted to make a political argument, uh, which I think the report achieves, succeeds that what we're seeing in state capture is not just corruption. And it's not just a Hollywood story of goodies versus baddies. You know, these uh, um, heroic people, forgive me, uh, they're fantastic journalists and incredible people that have done heroic work, but it's not a story of goodies versus baddies, that those involved in state capture are the baddies and they've been pinned and nailed by, by, by goodies. Of course, there's a tremendous amount of corruption that's happened in this regard. What I wanted to do is situate this as a, as a historical phenomenon in the, in the course of South African, in South African history and understand it in why it happens now, uh, understand it in relationship to how South Africa is developed, both as a, in, in relation to colonialism, but also into the, into the post-colonial period, post-apartheid period, and understand the massive and particular challenges that the state and government and the ANC itself uh, under, uh, faced at the, time of the, at the time of the transition. So what it tries to do is situate state capture in relationship to the transition from apartheid into, into the democratic period and try to understand it in relationship to the massive historical challenges which the country faced. And there are two in right. particular which I hope we can talk about. Right. So, so that's, the, that's your chapter. There are five chapters to your report. And that's the first one is you try and determine the political nature of the project. And then secondly, the most, this leads into where you, where you ended off a minute ago, just about the consolidation of, of the ANC's project of racial um, and, and uh, uh, um, transformation and the consolidation of territory. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that because you mentioned the history. So speak to us of the homeland, speak to us of the, those officials and how the, what is the ANC's relationship with these, uh, I suppose, rudimentary or whatever they are, um, officials uh, in the Bantustans? What, is, what, what happens there? Yes, I think it's South Africa's great unspoken story. And I mean, I think it's the scale of it is, is, is astonishing. I was presenting yesterday and I think some of the people, participants were just stunned at the scale of that story because we think it's a minor story and it's something that is in our, in our past. So don't forget, 20th century South Africa is largely a story of the last 50 years of the National Party deliberately trying to break the state up into a whole lot of different countries. We know the project fails. We often dismiss the Bantustans and the homelands as kind of puppet governments. And in, just, and in doing that, we don't recognize that by the end of the apartheid period, these were substantial entities. They had their own ruling elites. They had their, some of them had very large administrations and bureaucracies. They had their own intelligence forces. So they had their own police services. Some, they had their own armies. All of this needed to be reintegrated. And of course, they, 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 they took up hundreds and thousands of people. Um, um, most of those people enter into the uh, state bureaucracy after, after, the apart, after the end of the apartheid. So these things don't just disappear. They don't just go away. Those histories play themselves out in the post-apartheid period. And they play themselves out in quite extraordinary ways. And yet we paid almost no attention to those histories. So what I've tried to do is try to understand how those histories have played themselves in the current situation. Because when I started scraping at some of the stories around state capture, especially when I started doing going back historically, what did I start finding? I started finding actually these old bunch of state histories were playing themselves out. Uh, the story of Ace Makashule, for example, a much more complicated story than we like to tell in, like to tell ourselves in the, in, in, in the public domain around a goody, you know, a corrupt man being being a, pursued by the ANC now and in its new in its new cleanup in its new cleanup phase. Well, there's all that I'm absolutely absolutely sure of, um, which will be tested in court. But there are also more complex stories. Uh, you know, Ace Makashule was a was one of the uh, comes out of the, the the northern branches of the Free State, a militant, committed from Paris, from the township of Tumahule, very committed ANC activist at the time of 1994, by far the most popular ANC politician, uh, likely to be premier, overlooked as premier. Um, um, 
then overlooked over successively by, by, a number of, by a number of other appointments by Thabo Ta- Ta- Mbeki, only becomes Premier in 2007. Who's favoured in the Free State, incredibly? Well, it's the politicians and the administrations that historically come out of the Tabanchu and Kwakwa, the former homeland areas. So there's a kind of favouring of homeland areas in fa- against the, the former militant branches of the ANC. Why that happens? There's a story in the right. So when I started scraping at the stairs, so, can I just ask, perhaps, maybe because at that time, um, uh, uh, the public service itself, you know, uh, consisted of, of white officials with the sunset clause, and there was suspicion of their uh, um, uh, commitment to the new South Africa. Perhaps those old homeland officials were seen to be more likely to be uh, committed to, to a new government uh, or, or the ANC in some way. I don't know. Is, is, that, is that correct? A correct yeah. reading of that? I think that's exactly right. The two things that are going on that I can understand. One is that the, the apartheid public service, and I mean apartheid in the narrow sense of, of sort of white South Africa, is overwhelmingly dominated by, by, by white Afrikaans men. Gwedi Mantash made that point in, the, in, the, um, in his testimony to the Zomba Commission recently. Of course we needed a cadre deployment because we had we had inherited an administration which was fundamentally hostile to the ANC. We needed to bring our own people into the administration. Um, in order to, to, to transform it. And I think there's lots of merit in that argument. But what is overlooked, it wasn't just a, a, a white officials, white male officials that the ANC inherited. They inherited literally tens of thousands of officials from the homelands. And these essentially become the officials of the modern, modern, modern post apartheid administration, especially at provincial government level. 75% of, of pro- provincial administrators, provincial officials, are former homeland officials from from the various homelands, and of course, especially in those provinces like uh, Limpopo, the Eastern Cape, uh, Free State, Northwest. Those provinces today, which we associate with as, as with difficult service delivery, those are the provinces where there are very very complex histories of of, of amalgamation of, of former homeland areas. So that's the one story. The other story, which is no less important is that the ANC, after 1994, goes into a mass mass uh, membership drive, seeking to become a mass party in South Africa. Remember, it comes to power in South Africa with a very, very, you know, the UDF has been a mass organization, the unions are mass organizations, but the ANC has come from exile. It, it, it's a very small organization that doesn't have, institutionally, it's got a huge brand, but institutionally, it's got a very tiny footprint. Uh, so the ANC goes on a mass, mass recruitment drive. It goes from, I think the figures are 350,000 in 1996 to, to over to 1.2, 1.3 million by, by 2012. So it's a very rapid, very dramatic increase. Largely, its membership grows from former nurses, teachers, and homeland administrators, from people from the homelands. This is the lion's share of, of, of its new membership, are coming from the rural areas, coming from, from former homeland areas who are joining the ANC. And what it does is it produces... I think a, 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 a discord between the ANC's own self-image as a kind of urban working class based movement and the reality of it being a largely uh, rural or, or small town based organization with a strong footprint, especially in the former, in the former homeland areas. So uh, uh, this uh, sort of th- this cadre of leadership from, uh, from the homeland sort of then become part of what you then speak about. Um, you know that that the ANC did get the keys to the to the political kingdom in you know 1994, but not but not the economy. But this this cadre of 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 or this class of of official um, sort of becomes or moves up and becomes a class elite in the ANC. Is that is that part of that as well? Because what we're leading towards now is 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 the establishment or the culture that develops in the ANC, where individual regional and local members, be, uh, you know, uh, or leaders begin to uh, consolidate. Mm-hmm. their own power uh, as individuals, not necessarily, uh, well, for, to the benefit of the ANC, mm-hmm. but which ANC? So so uh, do, does this class then form part, as you say, that uh, Roger Southall has tried to define this um, uh, this class elite this, uh, that developed as a result of that? I mean, we, we're skimming over many, you know, important step, steps in this, but, but would you um, agree with that? So not, not quite. Because I think the argument, and this is what the argument really is about state capture, state capture is a result of the failure to constitute an elite. That South Africa doesn't establish an elite. There's a period in the 1990s and 2000s where it looks like a ruling class is beginning to emerge, a ruling elite is beginning to emerge in South Africa. 2007 happens, Polokwane, and that project shatters. And the argument really is that state capture is the result of the shattering of the ANC uh, and the fragmentation of, of, of the elite project. So let me take, if I, if I may, take a few steps back. 
So Ein Herder, ANC inherits a, project, a, a country which is grossly, violently unequal on, on racial terms. So it, 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 it seeks to transform the class structure by bringing black people into the middle class and even into, uh, under gear with Tabo Becky's notion of, of, of transformation, uh, create the black capitalist elite as well. So that project, and that project is, is very well reported on in, the academ in academia and also, also in the media. But what I've argued that simultaneously is this project of territorial integration, of re-establishing re, re the unity of the country by bringing the homelands in. Uh, and as I've said before, these are substantial entities. What does that mean? That means making all sorts of deals with former homeland officials, former homeland leaders. So if you look at the former, the first uh, cabinets of, uh, of the national cabinet, but also provincial cabinets, you'll see large amounts of, of former, former homeland leaders. Uh, um, Pumalanga, for example, Kanga, um, Kwandebeli, Kangwane, uh, Limpopo, it's largely um, um, Laboa officials. So these sorts of histories. The argument is that the ANC itself takes on this task. It, the ANC, rather than the constitutional, the state, takes on the task of integrating these former homeland leaders and building and building a, and stabilizing stabilizing the country. At stake, of course, is civil war, the breakup of the territory. The ANC takes on that role of integrating these elites. So it's trying to do two things simultaneously. It's trying to transform the class structure, and it's also trying to integrate 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 these, these various elites. And my analysis or my reading is that in the 1990s and early 2000s, it's actually pretty successful. South Africa is politically relatively stable. We end the civil war in, 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 in KwaZulu-Natal. We, we end the war on the land in, in, in Timbisa and in, in, in Katlehong and Tokoza and the Katoris areas. Um, there's crime, but political violence has, has come to an end. There is um, real growth of a black middle class. There is the emergence of the sort of embryonic emergence of a, of a black capitalist class. It looks like the project's working and the ANC is managing to hold it together. The ANC is at the center of this project, not parliament, not the constitutional court, uh, no other. It's the ANC through Lutuli House and through its various institutions that are unbelievably holding this project together. Now, one could criticize that and say, well, it shouldn't have been the ANC in the first place, but nonetheless, the ANC took that role on upon itself because it's a nationalist organization. It said that is our, my, our task and, and was putting it off. 2007 comes, the, 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 the great fallout between Zuma and, 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 um, and Becky, and the ANC shatters. Uh, and with that shattering, this extraordinary complex historical project begins to unravel. Uh, and this is what, I'm, what, what we're seeing today. So, right. uh, yeah. I, I just wanted to, to just come in here because the next, that's, you know, uh, that's your chapter three, which is the, the site of, 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 of the, the political in, in South Africa is the ANC. And I'm just recalling here um, testimony by Vincent Smith to the Zonda Commission, which I found, you know, Vincent, I think, uh, was able in hindsight to see um, uh, uh, his own complicity in, in, in receiving uh, loans from Bosasa. But what, what really touched, or what, or, what, or what I think also the Zonda understood was he said, how did this happen? And I think Vincent said, we, re we returned to South Africa as a movement in exile with no connections, without our hands on the, on the economy. And we were told by the party, we are going to work with uh, uh, patriotic businessmen. We are going to work with businesses who want to see South Africa grow. There's a withholding of, in, of, of investment, possibly by white capital. But so when Busasa came and, and, and sort of began to offer its support to the ANC, you can, you can almost understand that it would make sense to you, um, you know, that you have people like Govan Beki, who's been in prison all these years, not being able to amass a pension fund and medical aid. So people were... Uh, you know, easily preyed upon in a way by uh, you know legitimate businesses and perhaps then th those that were not so legitimate who uh, who you know whose intention was to support the ANC government in its vision of this racial and economic transformation. And I thought that was a very interesting point in a sense because when you're in it, you're not quite sure where it's leading. You know, and you can understand how how people make sense of it. I mean, it's the it's compelling the thinking, the reasoning. You know, the ANC is embarking on this extraordinary historical project. It's going to hold the country together. It's going to hold the country together. Uh, it's going to transform the country. Uh, that 80, is it 80 million rand that gets a year from parliament? Is it not nearly enough to cut it? It needs other sources of income. Um, okay. It's got a city with a hostile business environment dominated by sort of white capital that are, that are, that are, that are, that are, that are fundamentally hostile. How's the ANC going to run, raise this money? So it's experimenting all the time with, fundraising initiatives, some more successful than others. 
So what I, just, I, I, I just wanted to interrupt here because maybe you know we know that you know party political funding you know the laws have changed in terms in terms of transparency, but how do we expect political parties in South Africa to fund themselves apart from the the amount they receive proportional to their to their support? I mean, is, is this not also key to the to the very problem that we find ourselves in? It, it is, and we have to recognise something very very important. The ANC has never regarded itself as a political party. Uh, it's always regarded itself as a liberation movement. And the difference is important. It's not just, it's not just semantic. The ANC doesn't see itself as a party compete, uh, representing particular interests and competing with other parties. The ANC has long understood itself as the people itself. Its role is not just to compete on an electoral platform for particular particular class or particular group's interests. It is a role and understands itself as to hold or constitute the people itself. So its understanding of itself historically and politically is that it needs and is, and is entitled to far more resources than any just an ordinary political party because its task, historical task, is so much larger and, uh, and, and more important than just that of a, that of a DA or, uh, or, of a, or, or, or an EFF. Or, you know, it is holding the people. It's, bringing, it's constituting the state. It's, state. It's, it's transforming the economy. It's, you know, that, that I think we must understand is the thinking. You know, there's, yes. I, there's a, there's a, there's a one, it's on YouTube actually today. There is a wonderful uh, video clip of Brian Malefe giving the January, January statement of the ANC, one of the January, January statements of the ANC in 2016, I think it is. And he says something quite incredible if you listen to it. He says, I mean, it's a long story, but he says effectively, those of us who are deployed, we must trust the ANC. We must ask questions, but we must not ask too many questions. Why? Because our leaders see, see the whole picture. We who are deployed, we might get woken in the middle of the night and asked to do things, and we might say, well, what about, but why me? Thinking that maybe what we're doing is you know, awkward. But our leaders see the big picture. And one day we'll, be, we'll come to understand how our small part fitted into this larger historical project. So, of course, there's all sorts of excuse making in, the, in, that, in that story. But nonetheless, I do think there's a sense that the ANC carries this huge historical mission in a way that no other political party does. But then you have, let's say, 2007, 2008, Paul Okwani and the election of, of Jacob Zuma, a, a, a man who comes into the presidency um, already tainted by accusations of corruption with major debts and very bad financial management. Um, uh, and... and uh, you, you know, it's after this, uh, you note in your report, in chapter four, I, I suppose, before, uh, where you start to see the, um, the rise of local elites in, in, in the ANC. So, so how does that begin to happen? And what is the role of the Secretary General? How does the ANC itself begin to change um, once Zuma assumes leadership, uh, not only of the party, but also of, uh, of the country? What happens there um, that begins to lead slowly towards this uh, consolidation of, of power and economic power outside of, of formal economic uh, markets? Yeah, so this is where the report in my own work is on, is on much um, flimsier territory because the ANC is its internal machinations, internal developments are often very difficult to study. Um, but there is enough information in the public domain to start making to, to start making arguments, and it looks like the ANC over the last uh, ten years has shifted or changed in its character in fundamental ways. So what we see, for example, between um, uh, 2007 and 2012, is a very dramatic change in the character of the ANC internally. So historically. Uh, KwaZulu Natal and Eastern Cape were by far the largest provinces within the ANC structures um, in terms of the number of branches they had and the number of delegates they sent to national conferences. After 2007, we see quite a dramatic growth in the number of branches in, in Mpumalanga, in Limpopo, and in the Free State. And in Mpumalanga, the growth is something quite incredible. There's more than 100% growth in the number of branches in, 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 in Mpumalanga and the number of delegates that Mpumalanga sends to national conferences. So that by the time the, the national ANC has a national conference in 2012, um, the, what become the, known as the Premier League, uh, Free State in Mpumalanga and Limpopo, together constitute 35% of all delegates. 
Mpumalanga is now larger than the Eastern Cape in terms of the number of delegates it's sending to conferences. So what you have is poor rural uh, provinces where the contestation between former homeland leaders and ANC leaders, where, where, where that kind of where the contestation inside the administrations is incredibly fierce, those are the dom those are the provinces that come to dominate within 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 within, within the ANC zone power structures. And I think you see it as well when I've traced it in terms of biographies, who people are entering senior positions in, 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 in politics, more and more people are coming from those provinces and they're coming from quite localized positions as a, 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 a community organizer, a mayor, maybe a provincial a provincial official, they're rising up into, into senior members into, into provincial cabinets and then they're finding themselves in, in national cabinets, either as ministers or, or, or deputy ministers. So I think what you're seeing within ANC and in South African politics is the, is the, is the strengthening of, of, of the provincial character of the ANC, uh, which has huge consequences for local government, by the way, we can talk about that, but also then the rise of particular figures um, from coming from quite parochial backgrounds, if I may say, into, into international, international politics. So it's people without large uh, experience of running large organizations. Many of them are, of course, are nurses and teachers. So essentially what's happening is you have the rise of classes of nurses and teachers uh, into international political organization, national national politics, and then running and being responsible for for for, for, for large institutions in South African public life. So I think um, there's a that, that, yeah, that makes sense. I just wanted to then return to Mpumalanga. You, you know, you do set out in the report that there is a kind of model that occurs there, I think, 2002 uh, economic model, which then sort of sets the, um, uh, 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 well, they stumbled on this model of governance uh, in Mpumalanga. Just speak to us a little bit about that. And then we're going to return back to the, the court case between Fred Daniels and uh, our Deputy yeah. President Didi Mabuza and, and how that actually highlights the nuts and bolts of, of, of what can happen once a regional a leader begins to reformulate how the party works and how, how it uh, exercises power. Okay, so just that argument, sir, that you want to see that essentially sh shatters after 2007. And then you have various factions or various elite groups within the ANC that need to secure power in their own right. They're in, they're in furious competition with other groups, and they need, therefore, to start fundraising for, for, the, for their own electoral purposes, to fight uh, internal electoral elections, uh, local government elections, provincial, uh, the level of the PEC, whatever it might be. So they're looking for models of fundraising, not for the ANC as a whole, but for their own particular network or their own particular alliance. So I think there there are a variety of models. What I argue in the in the what I argue in, in, in the report is a model that is developed, I think, in, in, in Mpumalanga comes to the fore. And this is what we essentially call state capture today. So in Mpumalanga from 1996, uh, for reasons which are not related to state capture, and I must emphasize that, are not related to state capture. They are part of the sort of international neoliberal new, uh, near, drift, drift towards neoliberalism and, and, and the variety of techniques and tools of governance associated with neoliberalism. There's a movement in Pumalanga to commercialize the wildlife and the environmental assets which the province, the province inherits. You know, um, Jacob Lamini has just written a wonderful new book about the, the Kruger National Park. Uh, you know, wildlife, tourism, etc., was strongly associated with kind of white, deep the heart of kind of white, the white male, white South African male who looked after, looked after nature and, and, went, and had bries and, and felt. Um, uh, so the argument essentially is that post in South Africa has a, a much more ambivalent relationship to, 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 to nature. Um, what happens in Mpumalanga is the idea emerges to not just conserve nature, but to commercialize it essentially to, to transform Blader River Canyon and the various game, game reserves which fall under the, the, the provincial administration, use them to generate large resources, ostensibly that will feed back into the back into the Pumalanga Park so that it can do conservation, but to do a whole lot of other things as well. And they enter a, a, a contract with a, with a Kenyan company to commercialize the to commercialize Blader River Canyon for 50 years. It eventually falls apart. But you can see there's this idea emerging uh, there to use state assets, to commercialize state assets, to generate rents or revenue from state assets. Uh, this is not black economic empowerment. This is not black economic transformation as it was traditionally understood. This is using state assets to generate revenue 
uh, ostensibly to invest back into into the state project, but ultimately to cipher into for other purposes as well to repurpose state assets is the language we used in in in, in the in the petroleum promise report. And what you see essentially is that the, the cycle of the money is going to for fundraising purposes for the African National Congress. So Jacob Zuma is very much involved in the Pumalanga in the early late 1990s and early 2000s in establishing front companies that will be involved in the commercialization of these state assets in Pumalanga. Um, with the purposes, though, not of private enrichment, although there's some of that, but largely for fundraising purposes for the African National Congress. And then we see this happen not just in not just in um, the commercialization of places like Blade River Canyon, we see it in the land reform process as well. The commercialization of the land reform process to generate rents for party political, party political funding. I think that model might not get taken up by the ANC per se, and I think, there's a, I think uh, Matthew's pause as, as, as the... Uh, um, as the accounting general of the, of the ANC pushes quite strongly back against those, those those tendencies within the ANC. But after 2007, when various factions and various networks are looking for ways of generating revenue, they hit on the project of using of commercializing state resources to generate higher levels of rents for, for fundraising purposes. And I see that, that that is essentially my argument around what state capture becomes. Right. I'm, I'm not sure if I've understood something else in, uh, correctly around how other countries deal with corruption, but I, I have read and I've been trying to look at what Singapore does. We can't get rid of corruption in terms of state officials. I mean, Donald Trump would have loved that idea um, of Mpumalanga, would have worked for him, and he would have found a way of, of cashing in on it. So, you know, that kind of mindset now is all pervasive globally. But what I've heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, that in China, the, you know, in various provinces, there is competition between the premiers who are all appointees or members of the, of the Communist Party, the Chinese Communist mm -hmm. Party. But the political project there is, um, let's say Alan Windy was a, a member of the Communist Party in the Western Cape, and he's told by the central body, you can have as much investment, you can attract as much investment as you want. You take 10% for us and the party, but at least you build the road, build the hospital, you know, kind of you benefit the province and the people think, oh, look, you know, this is a great premier. Not that I'm saying Alan Windy is a, 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 you know, a communist. I might go through his rubbish one day and find that he is. But um, so, you know, it, it seems that the Chinese model, you know, uh, working in a cap global capitalist um, uh, landscape has found a way of um, mitigating that greed, you know, but in this case, we can't afford 10% uh, tips to publicly elected officials, you know. Um, um, I, and that was just a statement I had to make. I just Hazel Feldman Friedman has just brought in an issue which we can move to now because you speak to land reform. She says the biggest scandal for post apartheid South Africa is the corruption of land reform by the comrades on farms, politically connected individuals, kleptocrats, and business elites. And um, um, in a sense, uh, does that speak to us to the the court case that is the imminent court case that Fred Daniels is uh, has brought against our uh, deputy president now former. Uh, MEC in, in, in Pumalanga? So I'm not, um, so, I, so the work that I was doing was kind of around Fred Daniel's case. So the details of Fred Daniel's case, I'm, um, I, don't, I, I don't want to get into. I mean, that case, is, that case is coming up. But I do think that Fred Daniel's uh, naively, unwittingly, uh, perhaps not, uh, steps into a lion's den. Um, and essentially what is happening in, in Pumalanga, but I, I understand that it's fairly widespread, is that um, uh, the land reform process essentially is, is being repurposed. So farms, which are actually of value, I mean, in the, the, in the area where, 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 where Fred was, 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 was buying land, this was an area in fundamental an economic depression. Um, the, land, the farms were, the, the, the actual value of the farms was very, very low, one and a half million, maybe two million in some cases. They were being bought at extortion prices, three, four, five, seven million rand uh, for, for, for land claims purposes by, 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 by the state. You know, astonishingly high prices. Um, and this money then was, well, I'm not sure what was happening to all that money. Some of the money was, was, was straightforward corruption. Um, I think some of that money was then being filtering back into, into various party, party political uh, interfactual accounts. Um, but again, I do think what we're seeing is a, is a general tendency that essentially the cannibalization of the state, and it's not a cannibalization of the state because suddenly everyone goes goes mad and becomes corrupt. I think the, the contestation may is so wild, it's so fierce, the stakes are so so high, it's existential. Um, uh, it's not. It's not. It's not that you're, you're fighting for the. You believe you're fighting for the heart of the ANC. You're fighting for the soul of the ANC. 
um, that you are prepared to do, you're prepared to cut all sorts of corners, uh, including uh, contract with companies you you know probably can't do the job in terms of service delivery, but what they are prepared to do is they're prepared to give you a 10% cut of, of the revenue which they generate. And we've seen this over and over again in, in the State Capture Commission. Companies brought in to provide services that can't actually do the job, don't actually do the job, but what they are doing is that they're paying money over to, 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 to ANC officials. And here the important thing is, they're paying these people not over to the ANC as the ANC as an organization, they're paying the money over to particular individuals who are involved in a factional battle within the African National Congress. And that is why when the State Capture Commission, if it has looked at ANC accounts, it finds the ANC is bankrupt. There isn't huge amounts of money going to ANC accounts. The ANC can't even pay its own salaries at the, at the moment. It's not because huge amounts of money are not being generated. They are being generated, but they're going into private accounts. They're going to, I think a lot of that money is converted into cash. It's been moving around in suitcases and in, and in, and in, and in boots. It's going into private uh, saves in people's houses. It's not going into accounts, and it's certainly not going to party accounts. Mm -hmm. But some huge amounts of money are being are, are being raised, but they're being raised to fight these incredibly difficult and painful and vicious uh, factional battles within, within the ANC. Because what is going on is the failure to produce a, a ruling class or an elite. What you're seeing here is massive, massive contestation between varieties and different elites at different levels over over control of, of, of domains of, of, of governance. Of and governments. I think what, you, what you're also right that's quite important to hold in mind is that you shouldn't conflate the modus operandi with the objective as well. You know, I mean, what is the objective? And so we see what is, I mean, this was... Um, existentially, it was going to lead to a kind of bankrupting where, you know, I often quote Marx when I speak to people, not, not Karl Marx, but Groucho Marx, uh, who used to say, who, who are you going to believe, me or your eyes? Um, so, the, you know, the South African public, first of all, kind of uh, exposed to these allegations of corruption and, and cannibalism that the ANC is in a sense eating up the country. It's eating up our resources. It's eating up what is meant for the voter. Um, it, it just seems that, uh, you know, people are un unable to understand. I mean, Jacob Zuma, in a sense, always said that, you know, the, the, the leading party um, rules, uh, nobody cares about the, the multi parties, you're on that side. And that if you do business with the ANC, uh, your business will do well. So I think that, you know, in, in, intrinsically, um, it's become a, a, a self, you know, you look at Jeff Makubo's responses to being told that you know, he personally accepted money for friends and family and people don't blink. It's almost as if it's become mm -hmm. part of the fabric and it, it, it will destroy the party because it is unable to deliver, you know, but and also the amounts of money, if we try and calculate not only the state capture at the high end, you know, at, at the palace level, but, you know, as it has you know, filtered and corroded down, it's billions. It's absolute billions. Um, you know, Michael, so... Michael, let's try to calculate, give a, a figure... We talk about money, but also investments and assets that don't produce, not produce, turn out to be non-economical. Like the, the huge investment in Madubi and Prasida. I mean, we're sitting with the uh, white elephants. Uh, um, the cost, I, I think, I think, it, I think I can't remember exactly, three and a half percent of GDP per annual, per annum, uh, for the last uh, five or six years. I mean, that's just astonishing. But Marion, you know, for me, what's also important is that yes, the scale of loss is just, in, is incredible, but also we keep, reaching the wrong conclusion. And I'll give you an example. So if we keep going on, see state capture essentially as corruption, bad people stealing lots and lots of money. Um, what we tend to do is that we tend to imagine that what we're dealing with is a, is, a, is a state that is fundamentally corrupt. Politicians that are corrupt, but administrators that are fundamentally corrupt. That the public service is part of the huge problem. And what do we do? We end up penalizing the public service. So the, you know, what's the character of the public service in South Africa? Incompetent, corrupt, inept. Uh, in fact, the public service in South Africa is a much more complicated animal. Uh, it's first of all, it's huge, uh, not as big as we, we tend to think. So it's uh, for the size of South Africa's population and for the size of the country, it's probably it's probably not especially large, 1.2 million, uh, maybe a little bit bigger than that. Of course, it's uh, the, uh, remunerated at, at, at a rate that's higher than higher than what we can afford. But within that public service, there are there are there are many, there are hundreds of thousands of people who have left who were, they were left alone. If they were left alone, given the autonomy to do their jobs, they would do their jobs. 
They're not especially brilliant. They're not especially, uh, they're not rocket scientists, but you don't need administrators that are rocket scientists or especially brilliant. You need people to do their jobs and follow instructions. And there are hundreds and thousands of those people. This constant stigmatizing of the state and of government as essentially corrupt means that we are, that we are overlooking one of the huge opportunities which South Africa has to drag ourselves out of this mess. And that is to, to really make progress on professionalizing the public service and building an administration that in some places can work effectively. And we've done it in South Africa. We've done it before. We inherited an apartheid uh, administration, which in some places have, have fundamentally collapsed. I mean, people don't people forget that, that revenue services in, in, in the late apartheid government had collapsed. It could not raise taxes anymore. So SARS was an extraordinary achievement. There is important work going on in SARS under Kisweta to return that institution to functionality. National Treasury, even if you don't agree with its politics, it doesn't matter. As an institution, it was highly effective and kind of um, binding together, rewiring the homelands fiscally back into back into a unitary state. There are masses and masses of these examples of administrations that were successful. We risk throwing the baby out of the baby with the bathwater if we constantly it, it, allow ourselves to uh, sink into this despair of of of, of, of this um, sense of, of, of fundamental despair. I, I think. I think I think why you know that is sort of we're going to move towards some of your your conclusions that you that you that you or your you know uh, best best case scenarios uh, at the end of your of your report. But uh, another question everyone is sitting with is what is the deterrent to the ANC apart from a massive loss at 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 the booth at the at, at, during elections and that's not necessarily guaranteed. Um, you know, is it prison sentences? Is it, you know, and we know that, you know, law enforcement is under pressure, the NPA is under pressure, the judiciary is under pressure, all of this as a result, I think, of, of a, a, a faction in the party. That's the other thing to remember. Um, who are hell bent on, on, on uh, exercising control over the economy and in so doing benefit themselves, because that's what they've done so far. I mean, they've become fabulously wealthy. That money has not gone back into in, into the public pocket. Uh, you know, the, the, the potholes, uh, mu municipal government. You know, we, we have the, the AG's reports telling us exactly um, the, the effect of this. So will what what is the deterrent to the party itself, apart from transparent party political funding? Um, what is the deterrent going forward? Well, of course, you know, Marit, I'm, 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 I'm a writer. So you quoted Groucho Marx. Let me give you, let me throw you, throw back Grum, Grumsky to you. So I think there's a huge amount of symbolic work to be done, um, and that is to, arguments to be made in the public domain. Is it really the ANC's role to hold the country together? Uh, so I think the first thing is to is to let's have that argument. I don't think it's the ANC's role. Um, I think historically the ANC played a, a, a heroic role in imagining a, an inclusive, democratic, and uh, egalitarian South Africa. Is its role fundamentally to, to tie everything together? I don't think that role is the ANC's anymore. It's the role of parliament, it's the role of the constitution and, and, and various state institutions. So I think there is some work to be done around the ANC coming to terms with the fact that it needs to play the role of a political party and not a liberation movement. It is no longer a liberation movement. It needs to play the role of a political party. And if it can't, if it can't come to terms with that itself, it needs to be assisted to come to terms with that through, 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 through the various work of civil society and journalists and others. So then there's an important shift that needs to take place, I think, in the ANC's own understanding of, of, of itself. I do think, though, that there is important work in the current situation of interrupting how state capture happens, and that is through essentially an initiative around building and uh, building and professionalizing government. What is very exciting is that uh, that issue is now firmly on the agenda. Uh, Senzu Mutrunu, who is the Minister of Public Services and Administration, has placed it firmly on the agenda. There is a framework document on professionalizing the public service, again, which, which, which places the on, places it on the agenda. And what is beginning to emerge is a conversation around separating or distinguishing political office and administrative office. So I think this is a hugely important development and might be the basis of, 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 of a breakthrough of a breakthrough going forward. Why is it so important? Because the ANC has played this role of juggling and uh, integrating these competing elites by essentially providing them access to state resources by, by conflating the difference between the political and the administrative. Precisely because it doesn't allow for the emergence of an autonomous professional administration, it's able to deploy 
various persons into key state positions and provide them with largest and access to, to certain kinds of resources and power. That project needs to be interrupted. Uh, and it, it gets interrupted by professionalizing the public service, by creating some degree of autonomy of the recruitment processes, the promotion processes of public servants in and through the administration, and delinking it from the political process of the African National Congress. I think it will be very painful for the ANC to come to terms with that, but it's absolutely necessary, not just for, for, for um, the development of, of, of maturing and modernizing the state administration, but also for recalibrating the, the, the character of South African politics. And, 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 and that process is underway and people need not forget that. And also, as you say, I think you did a webinar earlier this week on that, that, you know, a stable public service committed to the citizens of South Africa um, is an asset to any political party who wins power. It's not something, uh, it's something that is yours. To, it, it is a jewel that you inherit. And those public servants, you know, uh, if you phone the passport office in, in Britain and speak to a, an official there around Brexit, they will give you the government line. You know, there's no, you know, they will they will do what government has instructed them to do at that point, depending on, you know, whether another party wins at that point. But, um, you know, uh, how far are we away from, you know, I was thinking earlier on, of I've had uh, read several accounts of ZANU-PF's notion of itself as the only party uh, worthy of governing Zimbabwe. It fought the war, mm. uh, it won, no one else, everybody else is an opposition contender. You know, the ANC uses that old Soviet era speak as well. Um, very much that it is entitled to 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 govern South Africa when we do know that you know the history too includes Azapo, the PAC, uh, mm -hmm. many other political parties. Who, in fact, several of those events we commemorate today were not necessarily ANC uh, mm -hmm. uh, led events. Uh, so that that narrative too, you know, needs to be reclaimed. But from but but by South Africans themselves. Um, we've, we've got about 15 minutes left, and I, um, and I just wanted to take one or two questions before we get to the, you know, like how far away are we from, uh, re, you know, retracting ourselves from the cliff. Um, uh, uh, Sinetem Bambeki has written saying, I can't help but be reminded of Siyanda Khadebe's Amizeti article and Moletsi Mbeki's Architecture of Poverty book. Both revealed that the state or the ANC was captured long before the dawn of democracy, which is which is interesting too, as a question. Does that feed into perhaps the culture um, that has returned with uh, with that? Explain that again. I think the question is that, you know, the ANC perhaps maybe in exile, not in London, or, you know, it was in different places. You had, you know, the leadership on Robben Island, you had, uh, you know, leadership in London and then, and then in Africa that perhaps, you know, several books have, have been written about. That is where uh, this sort of corruption begins, where leaders take resources for themselves and not for the benefit of, of, of more, that perhaps that this... Uh, that Mbeki's book, obviously, Architecture of, po uh, of Poverty, yeah, says that, this, that the ANC was captured before uh, yeah, 1994. I'm, I'm, I'm very nervous about these ad hominem arguments um, around the, you know, the character of African leaders, because we end up in these situations where you know, we look at the phenomenon of corruption, we say, oh my goodness, it's absolutely terrible. We look at these maps of corruption, where is it especially terrible? It's terribly terrible in, in Africa. And then we end up with those very old, I think, uh, racist uh, arguments. Well, there's something wrong with there's something wrong with African and African leaders. I think that those arguments are not helpful, um, and that's why I think historical views are, are more appropriate. Let's not forget something here: colonialism did something in Africa which it doesn't do anywhere else. It throws together people that have never belonged to the same country or states together. They've never lived in the same under the same rules, cultures, and leaders. Uh, before in the histories, they've thrown together in these common states. So the, the, the diversity is enormous. The task of, of governing these people is, is, is enormous. Um, and um, so that, is, that, is, that is one of the legacies of, 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 the colonial, of the colonial period. It's not just economic inequality. It's not just uh, uh, histories of, of, of white domination. It's, it's all of those things, plus extraordinary fragmentation of territories and the almost impossible project of what I call territorial consolidation, building states under conditions of, 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 of not just diversity, of, of, of people that have, have long histories of, of, of governance outside of, 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 these state, of these state mechanisms. So what you see in the post-colonial period is that the failure to constitute single states, partly because 
other state traditions are alive within those territories, or because the, the central state project collapses and a whole lot of other governance practices come to the fore. So essentially, Africa in the post-colonial period is an incredibly difficult political and institutional challenge. That is the legacy which we have to come to terms with. And under those circumstances, we are preoccupied with a couple of people that steal money, even if they steal huge amounts of money. Um, when we are losing sight of the fact that the, the post-colonial environment is intrinsically, unbelievably uh, complicated environments to, to govern and to build states in. So I think okay. that's, once we, once yeah. we admit that, then, then, then our focus changes. Yes, yes, we need good leaders, of course we need good leaders, but we need the slow and very painful work of building institutions. Uh, Nomvula Damini has asked a question saying, it's interesting to hear the homeland system factored into the picture. Why was it difficult to integrate the homeland system into the new democratic project is the question. Uh, in the old Baputatswana, for instance, I have always wondered why the democratic government was not able to build into what the old Baputatswana government had built. That's the question from Nomvula. I'm not sure if you want to answer that. Yes, yeah, so these histories are, I think these histories are extraordinary and they are very, very diverse. I mean, take, take, Take the Eastern Cape. Eastern Cape is the, the rump of the old Cape administration, uh, plus uh, trans trans Uh What is not so well known is that just before integration, trans trans almost got a war. Uh, so the history of, of, of a potential conflict between these two territories is enormous. They've both gone through, very, um, trans has gone through repeated phases of coup d'etats. It's, it's, it's ruling elite is unstable. Eventually, Bantu um, Kholomita comes to power through, through a coup so these institutional cultures and these political histories play themselves in the Eastern Cape. Uh, Jeff Perry is the, one of, I think, one of South Africa's greatest historians, also a committed ANC activist, joins the Cape administration after, after 1994, uh, the Eastern Cape administration. What does he find? For reasons which I still don't understand, uh, former Cisco officials tend to be privileged and get senior positions. What Jeff argues is that essentially former Transca officials are going to revolt. They will not take instruction from former from former Cisco officials. They are sabotaging and undermining. So the Eastern Cape administration emerges under under those political conditions. Is it any wonder that service delivery is so difficult under those under those under those circumstances? This was, but what is one is an interesting case. I mean, if you look at National Treasury has finally started doing spending reviews, largely through Renette Engler. They've just done uh, uh, some interesting work. They've just had a recent interesting conference. If you look at uh, performance of schools in the former BOP area relative to, to other, other, other schools in, in Northwest, those BOP schools are still performing better. Apparently, it's the same with schools that form with the reform of the Invenda relative to, to, to the national average. So. There is something about those 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 uh, departments of, of, of education in some in some of the homelands were beginning to get things right, but on the whole, and this I think is a very very important point to, to to keep in mind, the academics say that the homeland governments governments were largely patrimonial, and what that large what that means is a sort of technical term. It means that things were things happened on the basis of personal connections. You, you, you brought your friend or your, or your wife or your husband or your, or your niece or your, or your cousin into a contract to provide a particular service. That's what that, the argument around patrimonialism is. I think that argument goes quite far, doesn't go all the way, but I think it, it, it tells us something, something quite, uh, it tells us a lot about the cultures of, of, of homeland administrations. I think that culture enters many, many of the post apartheid administrations. Um, especially at provincial and local government level. And I think it goes a long way to explain why things don't happen on the basis of policy or on the basis of, 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 of regulation and law. They happen largely through these very complex, unstable and changing personal networks that, that people find themselves in. Thanks for that answer. There are many more questions that people have asked, but we, we are running out of time. Um, uh, I just wanted to, before we concluded, just uh, if you if you perhaps sum up, you know, what is our way out of this quagmire and what is likely to happen? I know it's difficult to say, but you offer uh, the, already a solution of the professionalization of the public service, which will guarantee long-term careers for people um, and, and stability. Uh, and, and then the ANC itself, what uh, we are at, a, it is at a crisis point. Its secretary general is, is, is going to court to appeal a suspension. Um, we're at a knife point. What what do you think? So I think we're in a, we're in a, we're in a very dangerous times. Um, 
if the argument is right, uh, if it's uh, largely right, and I'm ha quite happy to admit that it's that it's not right, but if it's largely right, then then we have to understand that the ANC is a place where a whole variety of elites from re local, regional uh, elites come together and contest and compete for authority. The failure, pro the problem of the post in South Africa is no one is able to become top dog, if you like. No one is able to consolidate power and become a ruling, a ruling, a ruling elite. So there's just tremendous contestation. I've argued that the ANC has been able to hold this thing together precisely because it's able to feed or direct some of these uh, elites and their, and, their, and, their, and their interests into, 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 into the state, either through contracts or through positions in, in the senior echelon. And, that, and that's come at the huge cost of service delivery in South Africa. Essentially, we've, 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 we've created political stability at the cost of, of, of a government that can perform. If we interrupt that process, which is what my suggestion is, that we need to interrupt that process, the question then arises, well, what happens to those elites? Where do they go? So the easiest and the most optimistic scenario is that those elites leave the ANC and they form their own political parties. So Ace Mahashule breaks from the African National Congress, he forms a political party, and he contests power in the free state against the ANC as another political party. So that is a scenario where you see, if you like, South Africa's multi-party system expand and potentially, uh, potentially deepen. That's a very optimistic view, and that's not been the tendency of post-colonial Africa. What is as likely is that elites withdraw from the political, but, uh, either remain in the ANC and, 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 and continue to fight. So the ANC remains a source of tremendous instability in South Africa's political life. I think that's very, very likely um, to continue. The alternative is that those elites uh, seek uh, seek power through through other means, and the tradition that and that that includes uh, the use of violence. And we've seen we've seen that. So local police stations become uh, paramilitaries of of, of of regional elites. Essentially, what potentially happens is, is a kind of war warlordism. So it seems to me, if if you push me to identify three scenarios, there's a kind of democratic version of of, of how things play out. South African democracy consolidates, our multi-party system deepens, elites break off from the ANC and form parties that contest on the electoral electoral space. We have scenario two, a deepening or continuing of the fragmentation and, and contestation within the ANC. I think that's that's very likely. And the third scenario, which I think is uh, possibly the most terrifying scenario, I'm hoping that it's the least likely scenario, but you start elites starting to say that our only real route to resources and to power is through, is through, is through arms, um, uh, is through criminality and is through, is through violence. Um, and I, so I think, and it's quite possible that all of these scenarios happen, happen simultaneously. So, of course, what we want uh, as Democrats in South Africa is we want that this extraordinary historical uh, confusion and contestation play itself out in a way that produces and resolves itself out as, as, as a democracy. Uh, but I think we have to realize that the stakes are very, very high. This is not a fight between goodies and baddies. Uh, this is not good elites versus bad elites. Um, this is a very complex country with a very complex history trying to, under, uh, trying to come to terms with incredibly deep-seated divisions uh, uh, through, through the resources that are currently available, so I think we are we have um, we have quite a uh, uh, rough ride. Uh, As we unfortunately have, have had for five hundred years, if not more. I, I, you know, I, I so love South yeah. Africans, and I just think we so deserve so deserve so much better. And also, we you know we we are like Croucher. We don't you know who do we believe you or my eyes? So people believe their eyes, and that the Zonda Commission has given them insight into the machinations, nuts and bolts, mm -hmm. and the the lack of morality or the backbone that people do have. Thank you so much to all of you, 838 of you who joined this afternoon's discussion. Um, we could have gone on for much more. They will, they, uh, the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, thank you for making this possible. Uh, but thank you very much for, for uh, um, agreeing to talk through this and we'll watch uh, further developments around um, uh, the professionalizing of the public service. It is a key uh, issue going forward. So thank you very much to you for your time. Uh, thank you for not being pissed off with us for publishing the report. We had to, as you can see, there's a lot of um, uh, interest. And so sorry that we didn't take all the questions. We'll try and answer some of them perhaps later on. So thank you to all. Um, be safe. And um, let's hope it all, as they, as they say, somewhere in the world. Thank you so thank much, you. everybody. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.